I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Brody Smith. Brody is a multimedia host and producer. I want to find out from him because I know his journey was not always straight. He went from one job to another job, but then he really found his passion. So I want to find out how we, too, no matter what type of work we're in, can find our passion, find out what we're good at, and do that in our career. So join me in my conversation today with Brody Smith. I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Brody Smith. Good morning, young man. Good morning. How are you doing? I am doing wonderfully well. Thank you again, as I just said to you a moment ago, for coming on here, giving me your Monday morning. What a guy. <laughs> well, recently, I've heard... A guy say his name's Gary V. I'm a huge fan of this guy, and I got, that's how I got the Brian V. To, to be <laughs> full disclosure, that's where I, I've been Brian V. My whole life, just the V, and this guy throws the e, E's on there, or the two E's. I was like, that's ingenious. I'm in. <laughs> well, he recently said that people complain about Monday mornings and how difficult it is. And everybody makes these jokes going, Oh, it's Monday morning. He goes, I'm excited about Monday mornings. It's my favorite time of the week. And I'm like, okay, I think that's a stretch, but I understand <laughs> where his head is at. So yeah. Yeah. I'm, that's I'm, the same, I'm, same idea too, with when he says like, if you're living for the weekend, you got it all, you got it all backwards. But I do appreciate you being here. Nonetheless, however, you value your Monday. Yeah, no, I do. And, you know, I'm, I'm learning to value, especially now during a pandemic, how to value your time in a different way is still a little bit of a challenge because there's a lot of things I want to do. And, you know, we all have to kind of restrict everything we want to do with everything we can safely do now. So. It's funny you say that. And I'm thinking, man, man, those are great answers. And then I just told you, I spent like two or three hours on the sofa with my dear wife watching Netflix, The Crown today. So we were not as productive as we would like to have been. I probably should have exercised, drank some more water. Done. But, oh, well, that's, that's this life, I guess. Brody, can you give us an idea who you are and what you're doing nowadays? And then I'd like to bring you back. Yeah, so I am a multimedia producer and host. I have spent a majority of my life being a multimedia producer. I grew up wanting to be a, a filmmaker, working behind the scenes, and that turned into a career in TV broadcasting. That turned into a career in radio broadcasting, which went over 15 years, and now with podcasting becoming more relevant and popular and live streaming and I'm finding that my flow is kind of changing a little bit again and so I still work in radio broadcasting but now I also work with small companies individuals on multimedia projects you know ranging anywhere from you know video brochures to to podcasting and you know i thought for a while that i'm like man maybe i missed the boat on podcasting in, in terms of not not in terms of doing my own but in terms of working with other people and, and i'm just finding that the people who are in the industry you know are like okay here we are but in the world it's still something that's just kind of catching wind mm -hmm. with, with businesses and such so i find myself again kind of starting to I don't know if it's that much of a major change in career, mm -hmm. but, you know, through all my years of experience now, I, I've got more I can do, you know, I, I can help people more. And, and honestly, you know, a career in radio broadcasting is a little self-indulgent because you're talking on the radio and, you know, you're entertaining people, you're, you know, and, and, you know, you're kind of like the person in front of the microphone, which, you know, I'm, I'm that person who loves, connecting with people, yeah. but I've always been more of like a techie kind of yeah. guy. I can use that terminology. You're finding a lot of people wet behind the ears, I guess, which gives you an opportunity for the businesses that you're in now. Well, it's, it's interesting. A lot of people, I'm like, some of the stuff isn't difficult to learn, right? Mm -hmm. When it comes to video and audio, 
but it takes time. Yeah. And it takes, I guess, a, a passion and an interest. And some people just have no interest in it mm -hmm. and they don't have the time more. So you can't create more time. So, you know, I, I can you, see, right? you know, them, them needing to lean on somebody and such. And, Certainly. you know, the other thing I, I've been learning about, you know, we were talking a little bit this morning about life balance and being like, man, I've just been watching Netflix. But one of my biggest influencers is my mom, who's a 20 plus year cancer survivor. And one of the things that I learned from her is balance. And that while we all try to have the perfect diet and work out every day and, you know, look, I love watching people who work out every day. I'm like, dang, <laughs> that person's motivated. That person's eating healthy. That's awesome. But there has to be a balance, right? Yeah. And for me in my head, I, I have my sister now telling me who just moved here to North Carolina saying, man, you're a really healthy eater. I'm like, I am? And I find, you know, things in the, in the universe kind of telling me, you know what, you're doing better than you think you're doing. I'm like, well, mm -hmm. you know, I eat peanuts, you know, as a snack and, you know, I eat chicken and rice. And I try to be healthy, but hey, don't get this twisted. Mm -hmm. You know, for Christmas for like two days around the holiday, we ate pretty unhealthy. So, I know. <laughs> you know, it's a balance. Mom's like, you know, you have to enjoy your life because you don't know how long you have and, and she's a fighter. And so, uh, you know, I've learned to kind of invest more in my personal life. I've always been very career driven and following my career around the map and moving. And, and then one day I just woke up and I said, I've been ignoring my personal life really. And I need to focus more on that and, and, and remember that life's just not, not working, even though we love what we do, hopefully. No, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Brody, speaking of family and, and careers and changes, I do want to bring you back. And what would have been your very first job ever? In it could have been volunteer, it could have been selling lemonade or hockey cards. I don't know if you do that. Were you in North? You don't have a North Carolina accent, so I don't. I don't know where you first started. But what would have been your first job? Well, I grew up in Jersey, and there people say, "Well, you don't have a Jersey accent." And I said, "You know that show." Uh, the Jersey Shore really ruined it for anybody who grew up in New Jersey <laughs> because it's like it, it's a big state. So North yeah. Jersey, not like yeah. South Jersey, and the Jersey Shore is a different. Mm -hmm. It's a different animal altogether. But my very first job was working as a bagger at a grocery store, and nice. then uh, I worked the cash register. Why which, did? You, how old were you, and why did you get that job? I don't know. I mean maybe 15, 16, yep. my memories, my long-term memory and short-term memory for that matter is very selective, but it was, you know, go, go get a job, yep. shop rights hiring. And, and it's funny because back then you think, man, I'm going to this job. All right. And now I look back going now as an adult, it's funny because I, I went grocery shopping yesterday and I enjoy bagging my groceries. And at the time, I'm sitting there bagging groceries, and it's a job, right? And you're getting paid minimum wage. But now I'm like, you know what? I would enjoy doing that kind of job now. Mm -hmm. I would appreciate it more now as an adult because I like interacting with people. I like talking to people. And so, like, I'm sitting there going, I, I want to bag my <laughs> groceries. And the person at the register is bagging the groceries. And I'm just kind of like, and then I'm a big kid, so there's a little – kind of switch right about where my knee is and then if you nudge it then this turntable will turn so <laughs> it'll like kind of bring your groceries yeah. around so I'm sitting there doing that going these people probably think I'm an idiot but that's who I am you know I'm just like kind of horsing around and so you know I think that really helped me appreciate you know having a job and what it was like to make you know you know a I don't want to say a living, you know, no, but just no. make some, some money at the time. Money. It's yeah. funny. I, I went to the commissary. I was invited to the com the, mili the American military commissary in Texas, I believe. And they have baggers there and it's, I've never experienced, but no, I've experienced people who bag as a job. And I think I might have done it, but they beg for tips. And I was in this dilemma, like I, I enjoy this. I, I can, 
do this. I, I'm okay. And I never experienced. So I had this dilemma, like, do I let someone beg just for the sake of them doing it? Or so it was a dilemma I had. And I was standing there like, I, I don't, I'm okay. Actually, we only had like a container of juice or something, but that it was their job. So I kind of, I kind of felt bad for, for doing it. <laughs> But it, you're right. It's it's a position you get, and I ask this question because I know when you know who I'm interviewing. A few couple of teenagers so far, but more us that are in 20s and 30s and 40s, and we look back. We don't know why we had the job, but we can look back and appreciate it better. And at least it can be a sign to people who are in their teens of the importance of getting a job. For us, we want some candy. We want you know a game. We want some shoes. We want to hang out with our friends for whatever the reasons were. Maybe our parents pushed us out the door, but there was lessons in it, especially when we look back into it. Where did, how long did you have that job and where did it lead to next? I mean, just a few years. So it was long enough while I still lived in town. I think it yeah. was up until... I was getting ready to graduate high school and then move on to college in another state. But looking back, I realized, you know, you build a lot of skills in these jobs that could be basic. I, I just heard somebody the other day going, everybody should be a server at a restaurant at some point in their life. And mm -hmm. the closest I got to that was being a bus boy for about maybe three or four months and then the restaurant closed. And I give a lot of credit to people who are servers, but yeah. then you know, I, you know, I think there's a difference between the way people approach a job. You know, I see a lot of teenagers now doing whatever it is they're doing, you know, if they're working at a cash register and, you know, they're having a conversation with a person next over, or they're looking at their phone while they're taking care of a customer. And I'm like, really? Mm -hmm. And then yesterday, again, I went to the grocery store and this girl's engaging and she's like, oh my God, you got the chicken. This is the greatest chicken. And I realize, you know, when I was doing what I was doing, yeah. you know, you're practicing your social skills with customers. Yeah. And, Absolutely. you know, it's about like, e even if you're only going to develop a rapport for just a few minutes, mm -hmm. my mom, who worked a variety of jobs when she was working, the last job she ever worked was being a, um, she was a bank teller. And everybody would wait in her line. There was like three bank tellers, right? Open there. Everybody would get in her line. They're like, hey, we're open. And they're like, no, <laughs> we would like to see Helen. And my mom, who I guess she didn't have the greatest relationship with her boss, who was mm -hmm. not a very good human, but these customers loved my mom. Yeah. They just loved my mom because she would say, hey, how are your kids? And she'd get to know them on a personal level. Yeah. And, and I love that. So but, you know, when you're a kid working at the grocery store, you don't necessarily think that way unless you were raised like that. And I think I was friendly enough, but I don't think I really appreciated. I'm not sure I really got to know any customers per se, but I did that. And that, you know, that was just enough to kind of get me the responsibility of holding down a job and making some money. And you I'm mentioned sure. you mentioned busboy. I, I recall now my busboy position. And I could, it was in a nice restaurant. I'm, I'm from Canada and it was Esquire restaurant, Bedford, Nova Scotia. And they, there's more middle, middle, upper class people. And they go there. It's not like fine dining, but they go for a roast beef or turkey on Tuesday, like a full blown meal or something. It was just a, a nicer restaurant stuck on the highway. And I remember the customers are a little bit classier and I'm not, or I wasn't, and I'm still not. And they're just so kind and, you know, you know, how are you doing? What are you going to do for school? And they are teaching you in their own way of how to, you know, serve people. And in that position in particular, I, I recall, and you kind of get some good experience through that. And, and I don't think we really sit down and think about it too much, but those jobs help. And then it makes me think here in Korea where culturally children generally do not work until after college. So their oh. very first job is their career usually. And wow. it's, it, it's, they're missing out on a lot. And, I, and that's part of the podcast, right? Is to encourage people to work as young as you're able to legally. And I mean, you can start your own lemonade stand and do something, but there's great benefits. And a lot of the people that you probably speak with on your podcast and the ones I obviously speak to with work, a lot of them started young entrepreneurs and, you know, people who are just, you know, in tough situations. I was speaking to one guy, his mom was single and he had to get out and work and help the family. So all of that I find 
is based around work. Brody, what about you? And you're saying you worked and then you were going in with this particular job in through high school and into college. What were you thinking for college and in your, in your life and in, in your career from high school? Well, I, I feel like I relate to most people who change their mind two or three times as to what they want to do for a job or for a living. Not like those people who are like, oh, I knew at 12, I wanted to do this. And I'm like, well, hey, <laughs> wow, that's pretty cool. Uh, I, I changed my mind like know, two or three eh? times. So, you know, I'm going into college thinking I'm going to be, a, I want to be a filmmaker. Okay, yeah. And... So is that is that what you took at school? You filmmaking or production or I'm not art? Yeah, well, my major was cinema and TV production. Okay, but I didn't necessarily go to the school that necessarily specializes in that. They had courses in that, but yeah. that it's not like going to NYU that has a real film school, right? So I ended up I went to the University of Hartford in Connecticut, and again, it was TV and film production, but what I ended up doing, I mean, it all, it all worked out because I ended up getting into TV production because they had a campus TV station. And I said, look, you know, I've been working with video for years, making movies as a kid. You know, I think that's the one common denominator is I've always been a creator, you know, whether you're doing audio or video, you know, it all falls under content creation. So I was like, okay, well, this isn't a stretch. Let's get into this. And behind the scenes, I had, an, I had no interest in being on camera. So I kind of just flowed into that. And I ended up being um, a videographer on the campus TV station. And for me, I was having so much fun because we all got along. We all loved what we did. And granted, we didn't get paid. We did it for free, but we all enjoyed what we were doing. Meanwhile, you're taking all your courses and... I was taking radio production and, and TV and film production courses, but the film production is like, it was a lot of study of film, which, you know, is really interesting when you're in those courses too. And, and it's like, I just want to make the movies. I don't want to find out like, you know, what is the undertones here of this film? And I'm like, you know, I, I felt like everything had an undertone of you know, this, that, or the other. And I'm like, I, I just want to make, I, I just want to make the sausage. I don't want to know like the essence of the sausage. I just want to make it, you know? <laughs> so, Brody, but, what was, what was your, your first content that you were making? You were saying when you were younger as a teenager, was there some things that you were creating then? Yeah. I, I you know, I just made like, as I called the movies, we had this home cam and it's funny because I just got this camcorder that, I had growing up and mm -hmm. my parents are getting ready to make a move and they said, Hey, we're going to unload some stuff. You've got some matchbox cars from when you were a kid. They're probably worth money. Do you want them? Absolutely. And there's the camera that you were the one who predominantly used. I mean, it was the family's camera to mm -hmm. take on vacation and film, but I used it and still have the same tripod, still have the same camera. And so I would be making these movies when I was a kid, which were predominantly some of them were kind of like tutorials like mm -hmm. on how to do this. And I mean, it, it was, it was kind of silly stuff, but um, I would make movies and I like classic eighties horror movies. Yeah. So I would make some of those and then my mom would freak out because I had the kitchen knife upstairs. <laughs> She's like, Oh no, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm making a movie. I'm, I'm not like trying it's to okay, hurt myself. Mom. Comments, like, um, no, I was, I was generally, you know, when I was at home, I was a happy kid. Um, so <laughs> I'm like, it's okay, mom. but I would make movies. Um, and I would be the one who I, I somehow talked my parents into getting me and like some kind of mixer. It was, it did color, but it also did audio. So you can hook up like an auxiliary, mm -hmm. you know, let's say a boom box in those days. And so I would shoot all the video and then I would put in like sound effects or music later on, but it was like VCR to VCR. You're hitting nice. pause and doing this kind of thing. And yeah. looking back, it was, such, it was such a pain in the ass. I don't know if I can say that, but it, it, was, a, it was a major pain doing it. Yeah. Like now knowing that we can do all this stuff online, yeah. so easy. But back then you had to connect your 
VHS players or your VCRs or whatever. But doing and, it at such a young age and having to go through that painstaking task, it just shows that you, you had a heart, you had a desire to do it. And then you, you're keeping it through all the way till today. Well, it's funny because it's just in this moment where I realized that everything I was doing back then, even though I'm not doing the exact same thing, it's there's elements of everything. Like, again, I never cared to be on camera. And I mean, I count this being on camera because you're visually on, but but for me now, it's more with the intent of getting stories out of people, yeah. you know, kind of like what you're doing. So, but yeah, it's interesting how everything from back then kind of brought me to where I am today. And that's probably going to continue to evolve uh, because I don't know where I'm going to be. You know, when people ask that question, where are you going to be five years from now? Where do you see yourself being five years from now? Uh, hopefully living under a roof, hopefully having money to pay bills and hopefully not in a miserable relationship. Yeah. That's where I see myself in five years. I swear to God, if I ever interview for another job that's what i'm going to say that's what i'm going to say that is like the worst question I don't, I don't have that question for you so take me through until today but i know that you met what was it a 69 year old indian or a man from india and oh, yeah. that kind of changed your perspective and view on what you had been doing after university well you know he was kind of more of a what I would call a sign from the universe, which I find myself talking a lot differently now than I did 10 years ago. You know, I use the word universe a lot, you know, universe, God, uh, a lot in kind of my everyday speak, which 10 years ago, like I'm a lot more of a conscious person. And when I say conscious, I mean, man, this can get into a really deep conversation. I don't want to totally take it down to the rabbit, no, rabbit you, hole. You, you can go wherever you want with it. It's, you but, said stories, and this is what I'd like to take out of people because it's a beautiful picture of how people do and why people do the things they do. So this guy, and I don't know why his name escapes me right now, but he was one of those things. He wasn't necessarily kind of the moment where, you know, I said, all right, you know, I need to go. He, he was more of, he was kind of like affirming what I was wanting to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the universe kind of has things happen in your life. And I feel like they put people in your life for a reason. You know how they say people come into your life for a reason, season, or mm -hmm. I forget what the other word is. But, um, and he came into my life for a reason. And, it was interesting because he ended up being an Airbnb guest of mine. I was living in Las Vegas. I had a roommate that didn't work out and I couldn't find anybody to move in with me, which, you know, the concept of looking for a roommate online to me is just asinine <laughs> because I looked for, and I would have people trying to talk me down and negotiate. Well, here's what I'll pay for you. And I'm like, you know, in terms of splitting the rent. I'm like, no, this is not a negotiation. <laughs> this is what you're paying. And I get you're trying to negotiate, like life's a negotiation. <laughs> but, but no, you're not negotiating it down to half of what I'm asking you for. So I felt like the universe, you know, which to me, it was just so silly. I'm like, I'm going to trust somebody that I'm meeting online. I'm like, no. So then, you know, and, and I love traveling. So I've had experience being a traveler through Airbnb in terms of saving money. But, you know, you also end up making relationships out of some of the people you stay with. They make a bigger impact in your life if you allow that to be the case. So this guy ended up being a guest. You know, that's how I decided I'm going to help pay the rent is by having Airbnb guests hosting them. Cause I'm like, well, I, I kind of know a little bit about this. I enjoy connecting with people. I'm organized. Um, um, not a clean freak, but I'm a neat freak. So, you know, I have no problem sharing a space. I had a second bedroom. And so, and I, I went through like the guidelines in my apartment complex and it said that you can't sublet an apartment. I'm like, okay, well I live here. Right. And, and I think that's in a lot of cities, that's the Airbnb rule is, you just can't rent out your house, but as long as you're living on property 
and it's your property, you can rent out a space. So I'm like, okay, well, that's what I'm doing. I'm not subletting the apartment. I'm just subletting a room, which you would do anyway if you had a roommate, except with Airbnb, these are people who are trusted. And, you know, it's kind of like the honor system, but everybody reviews everybody. So, you know, like this is a much better system than finding a roommate online who you're going <laughs> to trust. Like, so... And it was bringing in money and it was a great experience. And, and I wasn't, I actually wasn't looking forward to him. He was coming in for a convention. And the only reason I wasn't, you know, I, I was kind of weary about him coming is because he wanted to cook in my kitchen because I had a gas stove, which was, you know, one of the highlights of this apartment. And he's like, Hey, I'm going to cook curry and this and that. And up until now, I only had bad experiences with curry. And the reason I'm saying these details is yeah. because it ends up being such a different experience when this guy comes to visit. But in, you know, in the beginning, I'm like, oh my God, my kitchen's going to smell so bad, you know, um, with whatever he ends up making, you know. And I mean, I was ignorant. I didn't, you know, I only had one experience with Indian food. So, and he comes in and this guy ends up being such a friendly and warm guy. And then he says, hey, I'm going to cook some chicken curry. You know, would you like to have some? And I said, look, my, ex my only experience with Indian food has been not a good one. It was, I'm not good with super spicy food. Mm -hmm. And that was my first introduction to, to Indian food. So I'm like, I'm, I'm just not good with spicy. He goes, that's okay. Um, I won't make it spicy. So the curry was outstanding. This guy's company was fun. He was just a fun guy to talk to. And one night we're sitting around and, and, you know, by this, at this moment, I was in the middle of a two year contract uh, working in the company I've worked in 17, like 17 years in radio broadcasting. Yep. And I was at a fork in the road. I know it's really cliche, but I was at a fork in the road where I, I could either continue building on my career in radio broadcasting and look at other opportunities within the industry, or I can make a decision to, for the first time, really kind of put that aside and focus on my personal life and my loved ones, you know, and, and getting back to the East Coast mm -hmm. to be with them. And so I'm having dinner with this guy one night and somehow we get on the topic, you know, I'm telling him about my current situation. I'm like, I'm at a pretty big fork in the road. This is probably a, a massive decision because I've always been career oriented. And when you work in radio, you have to move every few years where the work is. That means you're constantly moving around the country. And basically, the conversation led to him saying something along the lines of, well, in India, we have basically the, the, the train of thought there is whatever you do in your life, just be happy. Whatever decision you have, be happy. And, and it's funny because when I, when I tell this story, I realize it's such a simple concept, like be happy, whatever it is you do. But for me at the time, it was just like, so, you know, I knew in that moment, I'm like, I'm, I'm supposed to be hearing this. Like this guy is here. And while he's an Airbnb guest and I'm making money off him, like this is, this is always going to go down in my life as one of those moments where this is like the universe going, you're yeah. on to something. Yeah. But Brody, you say that it's, you know, it's obvious, but if, just say in your case, and I don't know the whole case completely, but if you're not happy, but you're working, you're trying to maintain, you know, you have to pay the bills and you're getting all caught up in that, you lose the sight of that, right? The, the pleasure, the joy in the work that you're doing. And then someone, Brody, you, you got to be happy. I'm not. And boom, right? That's where it would, from what I'm seeing and what I experience is that's where it's going to come from. Cause you get so caught in the race that you're losing perspective on what really matters. And you realize, ah, oh, this is draining on me. I think it was a combination of not focusing on my personal life. Cause at the time, you know, I really missed the important people in my life, but at the same time I was like, this is how I know, this is what I know to do for a living. This is how yeah. I can make decent money. And if I'm not working in radio, what am I going to do? I, I don't, I have, you know, how can I take skills of talking on the radio? What other industry or scheduling music and the software we use? How am I going to implement this in another job? So there's definitely, and I feel like everybody who works in our industry or the record industry, a lot of people say, if I don't do this, I have no clue what I'm doing next. And I was in that fear. I had that fear going, well, I have to do this. This is what I know to do. 
And I would have people going, well, you know, you can work in public relations and you can work in, in marketing and you can do that. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't, you know, all I've ever known for, you know, over 15 years is working in this industry. And you end up, a lot of people end up going, I have no idea what I'm going to do if, if this implodes. And so there was definitely the insecurity. So how and, is that process between you and him in that conversation? And then the decision to go and the actual physical leaving, how was that? Was there ebbs and flow? I'm going to go. I'm not going to go. I want to go. I'm going to check out some things. How did that go for you? There was one more thing. It was because that was in January of 2019. And uh, a month later, or just a few weeks later, there was an opportunity to work in the industry. Uh, it was back on the East Coast, but it was down in Florida mm -hmm. to work with one of my best friends who I'd worked with for years. And I said, if I ever have the chance to work with her again, I will, because she's the best manager I've ever had on so many levels. And I want to work with her. Wherever she goes, I want to work with her because it, that's when working was like a dream. Like you would show up and you were with your family. You were like second family, which I mean, that's like the unicorn, right? When, you when you're doing what you want to do for a living and then you're working with a manager who's just amazing, who pours into their employees and they don't even like see themselves as your boss. They're like, we're just a team. Mm -hmm. So that opportunity came up and I explored it. And it was within a few days, I went for an interview had a conversation, you know, felt like it was a great situation. And then a few days later, I'm visiting like the people in my life that are important to me and close to me. And, and, and I just make the decision to say, I'm going to focus on my personal life. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, this could go one way or another. And, and I hope this isn't, I don't think this is going to be a mistake, but you know, I need to focus on my personal life. And, I, I had a, a scenario years ago where I chose my career over, again, my personal life. And thank God things ended up um, in my personal life being okay that I didn't regret it. But I always said to myself, I'm never going to make that decision. And I'm never going to allow somebody to put me in that position to make that sort of decision. So I decided my personal life. And it was funny because after I made that decision that I'm going to move back and I go, I don't know what I'm going to do for a living, but if the universe intends for me to stay in this industry and kind of make whatever impact I'm making in radio, which at the time I was like, I don't know what kind of impact I'm making. If anything, maybe people see me as a companion when they turn on their radio or maybe they, I've had some people tell me they think I'm funny. I think that's funny because I don't think I'm funny. So, um, you know, it's always very, but you know, you, you also don't want to buy into every compliment you ever hear because then you end up buying into every insult. So, you know, another Gary Vism. You know, like take, take compliments with a grain of salt because you also don't want to be engrossed by, you know, people who like, you know, criticize, insult, whatever yeah. the case may be. So before we get into what, what you do now and what takes up maybe a week of your time, you had mentioned that your mom and I, I read this about you and you mentioned it. Uh, my mom passed away this year from cancer in February and I started listening to Gary V afterwards. And then I'm like, I got to start a podcast. So my motivation came from the hard work of my mom and like she was single mom, three jobs most of the time um, at one time. And uh, so that's where it came from. But you mentioned your mom had cancer and how has your mom's life and influence affected you along with the advice that you got from another person as well in, in the work that you're doing? Well, in two ways, because my mom's battle with cancer basically showed me how strong she was. And, you know, being a fighter, you know, having strength, getting through situations that you think you can't get through. And every time, you know, if it would be a relationship that went sideways or, you know, a job interview that didn't pan out or, you know, whatever it may be. And then you get down on yourself and I'm like, you know, I would think of mom going, yeah. you know what? She's look at everything she's been through. Like, you know, I can get through a bad relationship and so, or, or a failed relationship rather. 
So my mom's strength really kind of, you know, anytime I would need some inspiration, I just thought of my mom. And I talk about my mom a lot because, you know, especially with people who are going through health issues, because I mean, at the end of the day, health is the most important thing. And so I talk about my mom a lot to give people mm-hmm. inspiration to go, my mom's been doing this 20 plus years, like she's tough as nails. But the other thing that my mom did, and this kind of came into play for me more recently in the last year or two, literally, is that my mom had a lot of different jobs when she was growing up. And my mom grew up in Hungary. And so her experiences were very much, you have to save every penny. Um, and, and, and not, not to like a fault, you know, it's not like you're living, you know, you're, you're living extremely meager means because you're doing that. But her point was, you know, I came from very, um, I I came from a very poor, um, time. And, and, um, so what she taught me, she had a lot of different jobs throughout the years and it was being a travel agent. It was working as a bank teller. It was working as a real estate agent. And then she could do hair. She was a hairstylist. She did that for years. As a matter of fact, out of the basement of her house, which again, you know, I'm having these moments, even in this conversation where, you know, I, I just realized I mean, technically, I guess she was a freelancer. She had her own business, which I would have never pictured myself doing. I'm like, I don't want to be a Gary. I love Gary V. But when I hear him talk about like, well, you know, being an entrepreneur isn't like flying on jets and having champagne and having this life with, you know, all these fancy things. It's being lonely. It's working till really late at night. And I'm like, you know what? I love Gary V, but I don't want Gary V's life. I don't want that life. Like, how does he have time? How does he make time for his families? And and that goes down a completely other conversation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sorry, getting sidetracked. But my point is, like, I realized my mom had her own business. And one of the things when I moved back, I didn't have a job. And so I took that time to learn. Uh, I learned about, you know, advertising on Facebook and Instagram. And but you mind know, you, did you go back home? So no, for, I, I had been, you have I had a place been, to go to at least. Yeah. I had been living with my girlfriend at the time and I didn't have a job. So I took it upon myself to kind of learn other businesses. Like what was it like to have your own business, to run your own business? Yeah. And not that I was ever really interested in doing that. I'm like, you know, I'm a person who, who I don't want to be the boss. I like to work for people. Mm-hmm. That's what I like to do. I'm an executor and, and, and I, I'm a creator as well, but I'm an executor. So um, I'm learning about advertising on social media and then what it's like to run your own business, like online. I dabbled in that a little bit. I wasn't super successful, but but it was a great education. It was great to learn. And then all of a sudden, you know, I started doing my podcast because, some, excuse me, somebody said, you should tell your story. And, you know, for me, p- part of my story was making the decision to focus on my personal life over like being career oriented and how, you know, I have a few moments in my life that are mic drop moments where I go, wow, I said that to that person. That was a cool moment. And, and kind of how I told them, because I think they made me feel a little guilty when I was leaving and going, well, we didn't know you were going to do this and make this decision. I was trying to transfer it within the company and because there was an opportunity and they wouldn't let it happen or they just didn't you know, want me for the position. And I put in my notice anyway still in the middle of a contract. And they're like, what is this about? And I said, look, you knew when I was trying to transfer why. So don't act like this is a surprise. And if this ruins my reputation after 17 years of hard work, I'll be able to sleep at night. That's what I said. And, you know, sometimes you look back and you're like, Ooh, I'm like, it's one of the proudest moments of of my life where, you know, I was like, I'm, I'm setting boundaries for myself and, and I'm doing what I need to do. And, um, and, you know, cut to me deciding to start a podcast to talk to people. I'm like, I don't want to talk about myself. I'm like, I don't, you know, whatever. I I'd rather talk to people who have made really big moves in their life, big decisions who just kind of one day woke up. That's the terminology I like to use. Like they woke up and they go, I'm, I'm done with this crappy relationship or, or, you know what, I'm not doing this job. And some people were forced into that moment by a health situation. Mm -hmm. And, and then that turned into, 
you know what? I wonder if businesses are starting to have their own podcasts because, you know, when you're, again, when you're in the industry, then you're like, okay, well, you know, this is going to start happening and then it's not happening. And then you're like, okay. And, but then I said to myself, I go, honestly, I, I don't know, like, what am I going to charge people if I'm mm-hmm. going to help them with podcasting and how am I going to help them? And, yeah. and so these kind of questions start if you've never been an entrepreneur, you know, all these questions come in and then like, uh, am I going to pay tax on that? And how does that work? And all these questions, if you've never been an entrepreneur, you don't, I mean, yeah. Yeah. why so, would you know that? Yeah. But my mom was a really big influence, you know, in terms of, you know, when she was doing all these jobs. And I said, my mom literally, you know, when they have that, that phrase, you can do anything you put your mind to. That was my mom. And, you know, so, so she was influential, both from a strength standpoint, but also from a, hey, you can do anything you want to do as long as you want to, you know, make money and be able to you know, feed yourself and your family and have a roof over your head, you can do anything you want. And that kind of inspired me to go, you know what, uh, let me see if I can figure this out. Meanwhile, I'm going to continue working in radio and um, I'm going to try to help people and companies who, who are interested in, in storytelling, whether that's through video or whether that's just doing an audio podcast or a live stream. And, you know, that's what I'd like to do because I like to work with people and I want to make an impact on people who want to tell their story whether it's just, you know, from a service standpoint or whether it's from like a personal standpoint. And that kind of came out of the podcasting thing. And, you know, throughout 2020, you know, I feel like 2020 is one of those years where everybody looks at it, goes, screw 2020, I hit it. But I feel like we got a lot of blessings out of this year. I like to look at the silver lining out of everything to the point where I got, I think I got a flat tire. I was like going out to go to work and my tire was flat and I'm like, are you kidding me? And I got to drive like 30 minutes. I was so pissed. And, and I said to myself, I stopped and I said, you know, I'm lucky to be able to get a flat tire. A lot of people don't have the opportunity to get a flat tire. So, you know, I try to look at the silver lining and the, the, the silver lining is, um, uh, I totally just lost my train. The inspiration. Well, no, it was funny. I interviewed a guy maybe two episodes ago and he's like, yeah, most things have it. And it's nothing knock on him because I kind of challenged him. Then he goes, most things, there's a silver lining. I go, oh, I challenge you. I think everything has a silver lining, no matter what, even, you know, the blessing of having a car, right. The ability to drive, the ability to walk down the road to get your car fixed or whatever, to have some money in your pocket to be able to do these sorts of things, to have a story later on to remind yourself of being thankful for these things that happen and to encourage others. I think those are all wonderful things. Brody, what do you think about what are you doing, what you're doing now in terms of your work? I mean, this year, as you mentioned, is a blessing, but it could be different than what you would normally be doing in 2019 versus what you might be doing in 2021 when things are kind of back to normal. What would be a typical week for you in your work? Well, I work full time at a country radio station. It's a family owned station in Clayton, North Carolina, which is just outside of Raleigh. And it's, it's definitely different from the corporate world, but that's my full time job. I work there Monday through Friday. What do you do? What do you do in that position? So I am an afternoon drive on air personality. I host the afternoon show, which is music intensive. And I also am the digital person of the building. So Mm -hmm. I update the website. I actually rebuilt the website um, on a new platform because the old platform, it just wasn't working. The customer service. Do you have to love country to do country? You know what? That's a great question. Um, I actually really enjoy country. Mm-hmm. I am more of a, I enjoy music, but I'm, and it's funny because on our radio station, we play older country and newer country. And most of the people hate the new country. Like that's not country. And I you know, I love Garth. We binge, or I binge the other day on the Garth Brooks special on Netflix or something. And I knew very little about Garth Brooks and it was pretty good. I didn't realize he stepped away for 14 years. Like that's how little I really know. But like, even with him, it was, well, that's not country. Well, what, what is it? You know, when is it country? Well, I mean, um, I know I'm going to get shit for this. I so will. Someone's going to watch this and go, you're such a tool. 
there's a song by <laughs> by Luke um, Luke Bryan called "Whatever Makes You Country." <laughs> I know I'm gonna get picked on for that, but I think about that because I'm not country. Uh-huh. I don't lead the country lifestyle, but I love a lot of country music, and and I will admit that I I like new country. I do. I, the real the reality I, uh, is though, I think true people who I, if you grow a passion for things and this is what i like about work i love everyone's job i could say someone who's a gangster i understand that people find that morally incomprehensible <laughs> I, I mean but there's some it's his job he has to go home and cook get you know pay the bills and i don't want people to do those things but if you're a lover of music you're going to love all genres or at least you know hats off to what they do so you know countries it's no different than rap to, to me, right? I enjoy rap and I can enjoy a good country song. I mean, I've worked in a lot of different genres, except for I haven't worked at a rap station mm-hmm. uh, because there are some Drake songs I like and some that I can't stand and like metal, I can't do that. But with country, I kind of got into country through um, through a person I had been dating at the time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I love Garth Brooks and, but... For me, I'm more like I do like some of the new country, mm-hmm. but you know, most people who grew up country and love country music, you know, they gravitate towards the older country. So my full time job is at the country station. I do digital. I, I you know do video production. I do the website updates and and, and that kind of thing. And when we occasionally do a live streaming uh, segment on Facebook, I can't. I kind of handle all that. Um, on the side, I work with companies to help them with, uh, I'm right now I'm working on, a, I don't want to say what company it is for mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. I don't think it's on Winespread, but it's a very big brand um, that most people have heard of. They're starting a podcast. Uh, I'm working with a local client who is starting kind of a, excuse me, a community-based um, concept of a show. It's, it's a uh, detective who's basically friends with um, a uh, young African-American uh, adult and they're doing a show together. And it's, it's like a multi-camera recorded show in a very, what's a very small studio. So I helped them build their studio and they're doing a show about their relationship, their friendship, mm-hmm. how they bonded and trying to, you know, basically just tell their story that's one project and then i'm working on another video brochure about north carolina and and what what is the what is the draw to living in this state which you know there's a lot of answers to that so i'm working on multiple projects but for me my passion in terms of helping people is probably more with podcasting you know helping people who have never hosted a podcast, maybe never stood in front of a group of people to give a speech or never been on camera, how to be a better presenter. How How would you, Brody, how would you pitch the idea to a company or even a community? I mean, because that's what I think a podcast does. It brings a community together, whether you're talking about a physical community to say in a small town in North Carolina or somewhere across the world or a business to how would you pitch the idea of the importance of having some sort of podcast as part of their advertising as part of their marketing? Well, it's, first of all, it's an opportunity to have more time because, you know, in traditional advertising, like most of the commercials we have on our radio station are 30 seconds, you know, so you only get so much time to, to tell the story about what you're trying to promote. So having, having time, also having the ability to tell your story on your own terms to, uh, you know, a podcast that has very little, you know, rules, you know, technically you can podcast as long as you want and you can, you know, if, if you accidentally cuss, then it's, you know, you're not going to, the FCC is not going to come down on you. So there's a lot less restrictions in terms of time, in terms of the kind of content that you can share and and how you tell your story there's not a lot of boundaries and once you kind of learn how to do it because you know equipment it's not expensive Mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, most people now can, you know, just jump on Amazon and, and get equipment that's, you know, not all, you don't have to have the most expensive microphones. Like this microphone cost me like $19 and this is what I use and I have a windscreen on it. And, but I see friends and I don't know what kind of mic you have, but I see friends that spend hundreds of dollars on like these microphones because of this, that, and the other. And, you know, while I know the basics of equipment, I don't know it on a deep level like an engineer. Mm -hmm. So when people talk about certain kind of microphones, I'm like, I have no idea what that is. Yeah. I've heard of that, but I have no idea. Like, mm -hmm. how's that better than this microphone? And mine, mine, like, mine was a hundred bucks and I got it. No, it's probably 70 bucks used, but it came with the arm and the pop filter and, and that sort of thing. But when you were building your studio, you probably didn't think, oh man, I got to spend a lot of money and I no. got to get the best of the my, best. My, my dear wife would not let me spend a lot of money. I was like begging just to get this at this She was amount. the gatekeeper. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, that's what I would say. It's like you get to tell your own story on your terms, mm -hmm. you know, with the, on, the only confines and boundaries are the ones that you set mm -hmm. and you don't need to spend a ton of money doing it. You know, you can build your own studio and I'm just here as somebody who can help you tell you what kind of you, you, what you need because you don't need a lot of money. Again, I'm an example of, you know, I mean, you do need some money and it depends what you're doing exactly, but you don't nowadays it's consumer pricing for equipment that can help you, you know, be an influencer or be a podcaster and then once you learn how to do it, you could do it yourself. Or, you know, a lot of people now just, they don't have the time. You can't make more time in your day. So it's like, mm -hmm. look, I'd love to learn this. I'm either not interested. Let's just, I'm just not interested in learning the lights or learning the kind of microphone or how to hit record or edit. I don't care. Or I don't have the time, which is, I think most people's issue. You can't make more time. People don't have time. And at a time where I think companies, thank God, are focusing more on their own employees work-life balance which you know i feel like working all the time and through the weekend and super late is a badge of honor i think that's a joke i don't think that's a badge of honor and and that's why like i love gary v but i'm like man if you're working all hours of the day you know i, I feel like he's given a speech where he says you know what being an entrepreneur comes at a cost mm -hmm. um that's why I don't really want to be an entrepreneur on that level because mm -hmm. for me, work-life balance is so important. I mean, obviously, you know, you know that you have a family, like I don't have kids. I don't have a significant other right now at this moment. So, you know, if you have a family and you're trying to do all this stuff, you know, yeah. I mean, people, people who have kids and a significant, significant other, they know balance, you know, better than I ever can. So um, I think that's, yeah, you begin That's to sacrifice if if you follow the whims or the advice of some people and entrepreneurs, you will have to sacrifice some of the things that mean the most to you if you truly follow that. And then, I mean, I do that even by happenstance or by accident, and I don't always intentionally do it. And I don't mean to do it by sacrificing family time or health. It, and those things will definitely go off on the wayside, on the wayside. Um, if, if you follow those, those tit, tidbits of advice by people like Gary Vee, and I have nothing, but you certainly will lose a lot of your time and you'll look back and regret and say, well, what do I have? I built an empire <laughs> and, and I lost, you know, I lost my, my family. Yeah, I, I don't have an exact look, I, you know, again, I, I'm not going to talk like somebody who's got kids and, you know, I, I don't. Sorry, I don't sorry. know what that's like, but, um, but you're right. You, you know, if you enjoy what you do, you can accidentally start going, Oh my gosh, I'm cutting into my family time or, or whatever it is that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So I think the one thing that's happening, you know, 2020 has forced us to slow the hell down mm -hmm. and really like people, you know, some people could look at it as I got to spend more time with my kids and other people are like, Oh my God, it was maddening. The kids were running around while I was on a Zoom call in the background. They were climbing the shelves and I had to yell at them to get down. And guess what? You know, that's real life. And, and I think maybe it's taught managers, companies to realize, you know what? You have to be more forgiving with your employees because, mm -hmm. you know, I think 2020 has really, you know, again, the silver lining is it's forced us all to slow down 
and maybe it's forced us to spend more time with our family. Yeah. It, it's yeah. forced us to not be as, you know, hopefully, um, hopefully it's forced more of a balance. I don't know. I, and, and is there a true balance? I, I don't know. And it's, I think it also, and for me anyway, it's allowed me to realize how selfish I can be. I mean, generally marriage does that. Having children does that. Being with significant others, family members, just taking an assessment of your life. It shows you how much you think of yourself. But I think 2020 does too, especially for people who are home more often than not, or you know, maybe some stresses that are popping up health problems with other people and just realizing for me is, wow, you know, I could really be selfish because I have, I, my income or the amount of time I had to work, my hours have decreased. So it's given me more time. And what am I doing with that time? Well, I'm finding I'm still spending it on me and not totally willing to give it up. So it just, it reveals in myself some, some uh, kinks in my armor that I, I need to work out. Well, one of the things that I learned this year and, and to finish, like, you know, when you say, how do you pitch a client? For me, the biggest thing that frustrates me is if you're working with somebody and you just want to make money and that's all that motivates you. Yeah, we all have bills to pay. Yeah, we all want to make money. Sure. But is delivering, you know, real customer service, meaning you care about your client and you care about the outcome. I mean, I'm still sending Chris, I sent uh, uh, Christmas cards to a bunch of my clients. And that's because, you know, I still care about them. I check up and I want to know how they're doing, but I also care about making an impact for them. I don't want to be the guy that just made money off somebody and what I did for them made no impact. I, I, I want to know that I'm making an impact and I find so many people in customer service, even in the radio industry, that especially now with COVID, well, we just need to make money. We need to make money. We need to stay afloat. If you look at it as in you're providing value and you care about the results of your client, then you're going to make the money and that's going to come through. That's probably the biggest thing in your question about, you know, uh, approaching somebody or pitching. Mm -hmm. I don't really pitch people. Like I tell them what I do and then it becomes a conversation that yeah. turns into, hey, I can use that. Or what do you charge or what do you do? But it's like, for me, it's like, I just want to help. I want to help you. You know, I don't want to just, you know, edit your podcast just because I need to make money. I want to, and, and I think that helps you be more selective. If that's your mindset, you're going to reject some clients and go, look, you know, I'm looking to make an impact and, and, you know, I'm not going to do this project because it, you know, it's not going to really help make an impact on the level that, you know, it's not going to help you the way I want to help, or it's not something that you need but um, in terms of being, you know, you were just talking about being selfish and this year I've learned you have to, you have to be selfish to some degree. You have to take care of yourself mm -hmm. before you take care of other people. And that's been something that I've been learning more this year. I've been doing more self work this year than I ever have. And, and that really kind of came out of um, leaving a really bad relationship and realizing that you know, I was putting the effort of being in this relationship ahead of my own needs. And I wasn't really looking out for myself as much as I should. And learning why and really kind of re recalibrating, you know, for a lack of a better word. And that, you know, one of the things I see is that even people who are married, especially, you know, we've been in quarantine, but you need your own time. And for instance, I know people that were engaged to somebody and they couldn't do anything without their significant other. They couldn't do a, a, a boy's night or a girl's night. And it's like, why? Like, mm. why do you have to be up each other? You know, it's so quarantine has forced people, hopefully, to, and may, maybe you have to get creative doing this, to spend some time on your own. Go read a book, you know, be away from your significant other um you know go to the park you know yep. do something that's still safe to do but you still need your own time so you need to focus on yourself you need to take care of yourself you need to put on your mask before you put on the mask of somebody sitting next to you you know that that whole analogy when they yeah, say put on yeah. your mask you know and you know um one more thing somebody had shared with me is like it's like the mastercard logo which somebody told me the other day 
um, I don't know what that analogy meant. So the MasterCard logo is two circles that mm -hmm. intersect in the middle. And so that's your relationship, but you're still your own circle. You're still your own individual. And it's still okay to have your own identity. And don't forget, you need to take care of yourself before you take care of somebody else. And that's where bad relationships start forming, where people take advantage of you and you allow that. Or, you know, you don't have boundaries, which is something else I've been learning about a lot. So in, in, in certain terms, I think when you talk about being selfish, I think you talk about it in a different vein. But for me, I've had to learn to be more selfish in the positive way, in the way that you need to be as a human to, to go, don't forget you have your own needs and, and don't forget about yourself. Don't put everybody else ahead of yourself because that is not healthy and that is not okay. And I think 2020, again, in a lot of ways has forced us to make sure that we are our, our own priority. Um, but again, I don't think that means like sitting around and like eating Cheetos and watching Netflix all day and, 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 you know, not giving your significant other time and all that kind of stuff. That's a different kind of selfish. Well, no, we were doing it together. That was it. But you're right too. Like I find myself just needing to go for a run, needing to go for a hike in the mountains, go for a drive down the road. And we do do that. Um, but I'm also selfish. And you mentioned with the, the MasterCard, it's like the Venn diagram, right? The things overlapping. And, and I totally get, get that. And, and certainly putting on your mask first before you're starting to take care of other people. Switching the gears a little bit, Brody, because I know you're on a time restraint and I don't, I don't want to um, go over that or you let me know if we're getting close. Um, but I also don't want to miss some questions that I think you would add some valuable insight to. So what about in your position, what is some satisfaction, um, even some difficulty you have in the work that you do? Like frustrations, maybe? Whatever, whatever, dis you know, disrupts your work, whatever is difficult, what's a challenge, something that, you know, if someone was getting into your line of work, what would they be looking forward to? What would they see as being some sort of challenge to them? Or what's just a challenge to you? Well, I think for me, when you work with a team of people, the biggest frustration for me is, is having, you know, your value system being so far off from a company you work for or people around you when your values are completely different in terms of, you know, what you're trying to accomplish. Like for me, you know, I've seen people in, because I'm in the radio industry, so I'm, that's what I'm going to talk about, yeah. but people who just want to make the money. And I'm like, that's frustrating to me going, you know, I'm, I'm working hard to put this, to, this ad for our client together. And this is how it's written. Or, you know, this is who is on the commercial. Mm -hmm. And knowing that some people are only motivated by making money, but to them, it's not really important making an impact or a return on an investment. And that bothers me. When it's you're when you're in a situation like that, are you more apt to say something to to show your true values, or yep. are you willing to just back off and just let the process be that process? Um, well, I, you know, I'm, I think sometimes to my detriment, I'm very honest, and that frustration can come out more at certain times. Yeah. I think after you realize that you've, you've tried to make the impact you can, you've, you've shared your thoughts as much as you can, and you realize that this is how it is and it's not going to change. And that's, I think, you know, at that point I realized I'm going to move on and I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. And you know, you, you know, there's only so much you can try to influence and, and help. And, you know, if sometimes you're really going up against years and years of a particular way, something's done, you know, and, and somebody once told me there's nothing more constant than change. Not everybody adapts to that though. Not everybody can do it. Not everybody likes to do it. So that is very frustrating when your value system is different. I mean, you know, in the last few years, you know, I like innovation. When innovation is helpful and it can improve systems, then, you know, why not? Why wouldn't mm -hmm. you do that? 
you know, when you can make your product or service better, but not everybody agrees with that. Some people just like the status quo. And I'm just like, what about what brings you satisfaction in the work that you do when it's, when it's a good day? Making an impact, knowing that you're helping people. If, if you're doing what you're enjoying doing and you know, you're making an impact. And sometimes what I learned is you don't know that you're making an impact. You don't know that you just made somebody's day or you just mm -hmm. made somebody laugh or you just helped a business with a, a lot of what I do is, you know, my full-time job is building um, commercials, you know, online and, and putting, you know, um, actually making the sausage, so to speak, and putting the music in and, and recording, you know, the person who's, uh, voicing over the commercial and putting that together and making sure it sounds as good as it can, you know, down to the, to figuring out what kind of music to use for the right kind of ad. And, and, you know, when, when you're making an impact, you know, and especially when you don't realize it and then you find out and you're like, I had no idea that I was making that kind of impact. Uh, you know, I've had friends tell me, you know, you've impacted me in ways you'll never understand. And, and, you know, it's, it's nice to hear that. Um, you just don't know, like when you're on the radio and you're doing a show and you might have 10 seconds to say something. And again, I I've, I've been told, man, you're really funny. And I'm like, God, you can, and it's not me beating myself up. I think, I think it's important to realize, um, the things that you're good at, but also realize the things that, you know what, this is just not something I excel at. And that's okay. I'm not going to be great at everything. I'm going to be good at some things and some things I'm not. I am not a comedian. I will never do stand up ever in my life. I am not a funny person, not on purpose, at least. You know, I make jokes. I inherited my dad's dry humor. But when people go, you were really funny. You know, I still have people tell me from years ago, you know, I really liked your commentary when you were on that morning show. And I'm like, really? I'm like, you know, and not because I don't think I was any good, but you know, you don't just, sometimes you just don't realize the impact you have. I like to know that the things that I do, because it comes from a place of wanting to help and, and making an impact. And like, I care about that. You know, I, I think people use the term people pleaser, which, you know, I think that can get you into situations where you get taken advantage of, you know, and, and that's been something I've learned to control you know, setting boundaries and, but, but at the same time, wanting to make an impact and, and do something that's, you know, a lot of people get into charity work and, you know, they want to make an impact. They want to help. And, you know, I believe in that as well. I'm a big proponent of that, but also like in things that you do making an impact. So for me, uh, it's, if I get to work with a client, and now all of a sudden they have a video that they can use as a tool and they're like, this is great. This, this is exactly what I was looking for or a podcast going, well, now I can, you know, I never thought about what it would be like to have a podcast. Now I have a podcast. Like that's crazy. And, and knowing that it's making an impact for them is great. Brody, thinking of an, an impact for people and also people getting into work. So you as a bagger or switching your careers, thinking of people who are getting into work for the first time. And do you have a, a piece of advice for them or a tip getting into work or switching their careers? Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> well, I thinking just as a kid, you know, okay, I'm going to go do this job, but now thinking back, that job was good or the experience you got from some of the other jobs, but realizing it was a place where it was a dead end for you. It wasn't satisfying to you, but you needed to make that change. Well, I think like when it comes to changing your mind about what you want to do, you know, I've heard more often than not people who are in college, they'll change their mind a few times about what they want to do. And then that's okay. You know, that, that is not something that's completely, you know, uh, a, a strange concept. You know, you can dip your toe in something, you know, whether it's an internship or get an opportunity somewhere and realize, you know what, this isn't for me. I tried it and it's okay to try something. I know some people who are like just afraid and it's like, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? It, it, you try something, you don't like it, you know, go somewhere else or, you know, go to a job and, and try it. Take yourself out of your comfort zone you know, if you want to try something new, you know, fear is okay. 
Um, but try it anyway. Take yourself out of your comfort zone, which I've done more times than I can count. But, you know, it's okay to change your mind about what you want to do. For me, part of the reason that I've gotten into wanting to help clients with podcasting, producing podcasts, coaching people on presenting or doing the live stream projects is because the radio industry, I don't necessarily feel like it's growing. Um, I think it's become such a business that because it's become such a business, I think it's really hurt the industry. Mm. Um, unfortunately. <laughs> I and, always think of, what was it? Private parts by Howard Stern. I, mean, I think great movie. at that, oh at that, at that time, like he helped ruin the radio industry in a, in a good way that allowed for podcasting in, in some sense. Right. <laughs> one of the greatest i love that movie it's so funny god um and well look by the way not everybody who works in radio is is is, is in the position of a howard stern or ryan seacrest where they're financially doing really really well not too and bad. they're in positions where you know you know people say well people are replaceable everybody's replaceable but you know look at those guys you know they're not going anywhere and they're making ridiculous amounts of money but for me part of the reason i'm getting into podcasting is because i'm like look this is where the future is going people a lot of people listen to podcasts and and more people and companies are starting their own podcasts and i want to ensure a future for myself and i i, I need to kind of it's not even a security net because I enjoy doing that. It's content creation and I'm making an impact on a one-to-one -one level. And you don't always see that impact in radio or feel that impact, but you can if you're working with a client and working with somebody one-on-one. -on -one. But I also want to make sure that the future is like, for me, it's part survival. You know, I want to have a, a job years to come because if I, if I only put all my eggs right now in the radio broadcasting basket and that's all I do, and one day, you know, the industry just completely implodes on itself, uh, even more than it already has been doing, then, then what am I going to do? Like, I'll be in my 50s and I'm like, now what? Mm -hmm. You know, I still have years to work. So, you know, part of it is ensuring that I have work and that I'm going in the direction of where the future is going. Live streaming, people doing their own shows and podcasting and being a part of that. And, you know, so for me, it's think about those things, yeah. you know, think yeah. about, you know, I still have friends that are like, I have to get a radio job. And a lot of people really recently have gotten, you know, during the year of COVID have gotten let go. They've gotten furloughed and they've been without jobs. I have a few friends that have been without jobs for going in a year, two years. And I'm like, look, you have the skills to do other things. And this has been a big uh, education for me as well, because you know, for me, where two years ago, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do if I'm not in radio. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, how can I implement these skills and other things? And I would have people go, well, just work in marketing. And I'm like, I could, but doing this, you know, working in production and having, you know, setting up lights and having a teleprompter and having, you know, a microphone, like this is my real passion. I love doing this and, and I want to help other people. That's really, so I tell my friends, I go, you have the talent, you have the skills to do things other than radio. Start thinking about that and, and how you can do that because, you know, if, if you're just only going, this is all I'm going to do, like how long do you need to be out of work before you finally realize you need to go, you know, and then, and then Pivot, I've seen yeah. people who have pivoted, you know, and gone, all right, I'm, I had a friend get into podcasting this year, but he does it like they do a show on video and they have a multi-camera show. And, and I'm like, you know, a year ago, you weren't doing this. I'm proud of you. That's mm -hmm. huge. Start, start thinking more like that because, you know, you have to make sure, you know, it's your own survival, but also go with the times. And, you know, unfortunately, our businesses, you know, gotten, you know, times change. People who used to work in the newspaper industry, you know, they had to pivot. The newspaper industry had to pivot. Now they're online as well. And, you know, maybe some of those people are doing different things now for careers. I know people who have left radio broadcasting to go be fitness coaches or to go start their own 
um, to go start their own business. Mm -hmm. So I've seen that happening a lot lately. So, you know, you, you have to be multifaceted, but you also have to look outside of, you know, what have I been doing so long? Start thinking how you can do other things and, you know, um, make sure that you're not in a position where if you lose your job that you're like, well, I can't do anything else. You know, speaking um, of that being multifaceted, is there a skill that you had to develop now that, you know, looking to people who are listening and something that they might want to build upon maybe as they're younger or getting into this industry, is there a certain skill that you have or are building that is necessary in this line of work? Um, or even a, a talent that it, it's helpful. Well, I, I, I think, I think it's just a matter of always wanting to learn. You never stop learning. There's constantly things to learn and educate yourself on. I mean, to be honest, I, I'm still learning, you know, yesterday mm -hmm. I was looking into what are the best kind of cameras that are affordable for streaming? Cause technology constantly changes. So I'm like, well now what are the best kind of cameras to use? And uh, you know, always learning and then finding out where to go to learn. Cause you know, the, it is a little overwhelming. There are so many avenues in terms of like, there's so many conventions, there's mm -hmm. so many online courses and that can get overwhelming too and go, well, you know, what makes this better than that? Like I was on LinkedIn and, and doing LinkedIn courses on basic things the other day that, you know, it's funny, like the skills that most people have, you know, I was updating my resume to include what I'm currently doing on there now and the pro the side projects that I'm doing, you know, if a client goes, well, you know, what's some of the work you've done? And then I've got my resume to say, Hey, here mm -hmm. are the people I've worked with and I'm not the greatest resume person. Like i you know, I, I constantly learn and, and you think you get it right. And then your sister, you know, who is successful, looks at it and says, oh, <laughs> and you're like, oh my God. So when you say what kind of, you know, skills, I think for any human, never stop learning. And yeah. even when you think you have it, you don't have it a hundred percent. There's always something that you can learn. You know, there's always things that I'm learning about video production and that, you know, you can use a microphone like this. You can use a shotgun microphone. You can use a lavalier microphone. I mean, and then what kinds and then for what situations and there's constantly things, but then technology changes too. You know, um, where you can learn constantly changes too. lynda.com, LinkedIn. And then you're like, well, I haven't really had a lot of experience with lynda.com and then just trying it. And so, um, an interest. What is lynda.com? I've never even heard of that before. I'm probably not the person to ask for that, but it, you know, lynda.com is a place you can go. It's, I think you could take courses and, okay. and I think it's, I think you have to pay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, I do that stuff on LinkedIn cause you yeah. can take courses there. And so I, I I've learned a lot on LinkedIn. I didn't even know you can do you. courses on LinkedIn. I mean, I think you have to, it's a, this is the premier, the premium yeah. subscription. Yeah. And I mean, for me, I did the 30 day, like the free trial and I've yeah. learned a lot. And so for me, uh, you know, it's funny because while I have the skill set to do technical things that not everybody, not everybody knows to do what you and I can do with lights and cameras and microphones. But then, you know, my shortcomings are not being great at cover letters or resumes. And so it's constantly learning and knowing even the things that you are good at doing you don't know everything. It's funny you know? about resumes. I'm learning this, especially through LinkedIn. And I found it's a valuable resource. And I'm going to say that I found you and I asked you to come on here. So it wasn't that you were trying to get out there. And I think I asked you a few times and it took us a little while to set up, but I asked you, but going on to LinkedIn, I find it amazing. Like to defy, I actually interviewed someone else before and that's what his forte is finding people's skills and talents in defining them for years i thought just, just put the job you know my job my job title that's enough they're going to be impressed by my resume but the more you realize the purpose of the resume and to define those skills that's what people are looking for if you don't have someone you know in the industry already well, and the other thing too is for me one of the biggest kind of questions that i've had in the last like year is what is my title? 
what is, what is my title? And because then you also have to think if you come up with a fancy title, like executive janitorial, you know, like whatever it is, but excuse me, if you think of a fancy title is the average person who is not in your industry going to know what that means? Mm. What does that mean? Like uh, a lot of times uh, I'm a big um, film and TV fan and, and I heard the term showrunner. Uh, where actors are talking about, well, the showrunner was Matt Miller. And I'm like, what does showrunner mean? And I'm a huge, like, I- I'm, a, I'm a TV film fan. And mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't know what a showrunner is. Mm-hmm. I've been interested in, in filmmaking since I was a kid. I have no idea what the term showrunner is. What the hell does that mean? Executive producer is another word for showrunner. But then you okay. see like 10 executive producers in the credits come up on your like favorite show. And then you're like, is it take 10 executive producers to executive produce the show? And what does it mean? The difference between executive producer and producer. So I finally settled on multimedia producer mm-hmm. and I mean, multimedia and most people probably have a general idea of what multimedia is and producer means like you have your hands in, in, in what you're doing. So I kind of just settled on multimedia producer and then I'll throw in there sometimes host because I have the ability to host or, you know, but now kind of to be able to help, people who have who have never sat in front of either even a zoom meeting to lead a yeah. zoom meeting like it's you know what is it? a lot of newbies this year yeah yeah uh, well I, you know again 2020 hopefully has helped people in their skill set like even from a presenting standpoint like how to present on camera in your own living room when you're not in a boardroom <laughs> how do you do that? i happen to take a, a teaching certificate starting in October of last year and we used Zoom throughout. So I was I was prepped and ready for it. It was the first time we used it and I was kind of learning a little bit more about it and able to teach the teacher, you know, oh, you know, this is how we go into breakout rooms and all this sort of stuff. And this is the best way to send audio. And I was learning it and then it came to this and then starting. So it takes a lot of initiative to learn, especially if you're wanting to get into your own job or changing your job not waiting right and that's what i find 2020 we mentioned a few times now is the advantage the blessing in 2020 is what did you do with it did you learn or did you just sit back and say you know oh wow the the world's gonna end or you know did you take the bull by the horns and and learn something and and find yourself being in a productive position rather than in, in a pity party sort of position did you take advantage of the opportunity yeah, yeah. Th- that's actually a great, that's a great question. You know, while so many people were bitching that 2020 sucks and, uh, you know, peace 2020 by Felicia. It's like, what did you learn? What did you learn from, from this year? A year that in, in some ways, like, no other year has been like it. So what if it's you like a that? mulligan, if you had the ability to learn, you get a free mulligan, you get a free, it's, it's a free year for you to have an excuse not to be as responsible as you need to be, but to take time for yourself, as we talked about self care and learning all about and, and upgrading yourself. Like it's, it was just a, it was like a computer upgrade for your system. If you need, if you really needed it, it this was the year to do it. Not you know, it, the it, other ones. Right, right. Well, and, and one of the things I think, you know, that I had learned is you expect sometimes people in these positions that use, let's say something like Zoom, like often, and you're like, okay, well, people know what they're doing. And then you get on there. And then I realize I'm like, oh, my God, my biggest pet peeve of Zoom, please, sh-, especially when you have, you know, it's like, it's different if it's you and I and we're having a conversation. But if you have a a whole group of people on there and the way zoom works is if your microphone is live it's open and let's say something happens in the background and the sound of whatever it may be it could be somebody opening the door and then the camera switches to them right and then all of a sudden and then you hear it or if somebody coughs but it's so loud if you're wearing earbuds and you're like yeah, that's true. I could. I. I was in a few of the groups for a class, and I could see the mics on, and I'm just looking at the mic. <laughs> like, I don't want to say it. Just see if by looking at it, will it turn off? 
and you're waiting for something to happen. Like you like it someone's does. kids gonna scream yeah, bloody noises. Over. It's just noisy and you know exactly where it's coming from. I know you're pressed for time. I'm gonna jump through my questions, but you mentioned your sister a couple of times and she seems to be a solid rock for you. What do you think about character? And you mentioned integrity and the value system. How important is it to bring your utmost um, character in your career? Um, and how, maybe even how you've developed in your thinking of this from being a teenager up until now. I was just, I was just distracted by like my video shot. Cause I, I don't know. Is, is it, is it too bright? Nope. It's good. Sometimes I have the sun coming up here, but I'm nighttime. <laughs> yeah. I, I like to have everything on manual because, you know, and I have like the windows open. So I'm like, because if it's on auto, then everything gets funky. And so no, you're, just, you're good. Right. Um, for Character me, and career. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's super important. And, you know, for me, you know, if somebody says, well, what is it about you that, you know, what is something that would describe you? And, and while it's not a super sexy word, integrity, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm a very integral person. I'm very honest, sometimes to a fault. Um, passion comes through and, you know, people are like, oh, but integrity. Um, so I find, I find as I'm getting older, the, I'm able to learn, I'm able to see faults that I have and try to, with the best of my ability and whatever else I have at my disposal to chisel those away. Right. Not, but to acknowledge that I have them, had them. They're a part of me. I can understand other people, how, you know, the worst of the worst, I can understand how they would do those things in those, those situations. Um, so not being so judgmental, but just working on myself and trying to chisel away all these things that, that are not uh, necessary in one's life. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, as you get older, hopefully, you know, the things that really do need, well, while you don't necessarily, you know, completely change as a human being, you know, maybe you want to work on like, you know, for me, I'm told sometimes like, Hey, you know, maybe you need to work on X, Y, and Z. And mm -hmm. like, okay. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I would like to consciously work, but you have to make that effort to consciously mm -hmm. go. I want to be, be I want to do better. I want to improve in whatever it is. Um, you know, maybe I do this too much or maybe I do that too much. And, you know, I, <laughs> I had somebody recently tell me there are moments if I get very frustrated or there are moments where my fuse goes short and mm -hmm. I've recognized it happens with stupid things. And when people do stupid things, people make mistakes. We all make mistakes. And I think, you know, the difference between somebody doing something stupid and somebody making a genuine mistake. And for me, I get very frustrated very easily at stupid things. And that comes out. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a very honest person. And, and, you know, I've been in a meeting where I'm sitting there and I'm so frustrated about something, some things that have been addressed and haven't changed. And it's like, am I the only one in this room that sees X, Y, and Z and mm -hmm. goes, what are we thinking? What are we like? Hello. And I'll, you know, I, um, I get, I get really foul mouth, you know, when it, when that passion slash frustration comes out, and I, I even recently had a coworker say, hey, there's somebody who, you know, has gotten offended. You know, you dropped the F-bomb a few times in there. I'm like, oh, well, good. Okay. You know, yeah, we know. Like, so, so let me get this right. We're more focused on the fact that, you know, I'm using bad language, but we're not focused on the fact at all that we're not, you know, we're not thinking hey, am I providing true value for my client? Mm -hmm. And what kind of results are they getting? 
but but it's more important to focus on the fact you're offended because I said the F word like a few times. So I'm like, do you even wonder why I did that? Did you hear the passion in my voice and, and the frustration in that maybe I might have a point or you're just focused on the fact that like, oh, I'm offended. It's, I heard something about uh, marital, marital advice not long ago. And it was talking about a couple who were just arguing. And then maybe the husband was losing or something. And then the wife made a really good point. And he said, yeah, but you're slouching. Meaning no matter what she said, he wasn't going to listen. And by him pointing out something else, he felt that he had a win or he he won the argument. And, And I think what you're saying with that is also true. Whatever you're bringing up to point out, something that's not going right in an organization and someone's going to point out the, you know, the, the curse or whatever it is you said as the problem in the room, they're, they're missing the main point. And I think we, that happens a lot. I, I, I think I generally, you know, I'm, I'm pretty presentable in terms of how I talk, but then those moments that happen, and that's naturally how I am. So then I'll just, you know, and then the cusses start kind of flowing yeah. out like it's yeah. a part yeah. of regular conversation. But that happens, you know, again, that comes from passion, passion yeah. and or frustration. Yeah. Integrity. And, you, you like to see character bubbling up or at least people who are of sound character bubbling up to the surface within the work that you do. But that doesn't always show in the prettiest way, right? Like. Yeah. You'll see it and it's not like, but what is, what is perfect? Like, what is a, you know, like I'll I'll never forget the story of Gary V who we've referenced a few times, but him talking about how he gets these speeches. He, he, um, he'll be hired to do uh, a talk somewhere and then they'll want to pay him like $500,000, ridiculous. But they say, Hey, you can't, you can't cuss. Because one of Gary V's things, if you follow him, you love his energy. And he's one of those people where he just like, you know, him cussing is just part of his, I feel like it's his energy and his passion, you know, kind of like yeah, when he's I so go pumped. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. right on the edge every time. And so they say to him, you just can't cuss, you know? And he's like, I'm afraid I can't, I'm not your person. And he's not willing to change who he is because you know they want him to fit in the square box for an hour for two hours and go you just you just can't cuss and it's like okay well you know thanks for the invite but i i just can't be your person yeah it's funny about it's funny about cursing it i don't curse myself i it's not that i don't know curse words or i haven't cursed in my life but I, i just generally don't and i think i was more sensitive to the subject years ago but i'm less and i think it's just you know it's some people just communicate that way and I'm not, I think in my, my heart or my mind, I was like, oh, 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 before. And I was probably offended, but I, I'm like, go ahead. And I can hear the point. I understand what's being said. And I appreciate people who are willing to, to live to their true self, as you're saying about Gary V. And that's who he is. And that's what you're going to get. And I was actually listening to him my last evening. Maybe it was your this morning. He was doing a, a live thing with bar stool i think and just like every 20 30 words is is a curse word right it just, but it's just like saying and or 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 you know some conjunction somewhere for him that's just what it is he's not trying to offend he's not telling someone off well it's like you can watch simon sinek who's another favorite of mine love simon sinek and completely different delivery but again great content but it's and i've seen studies where one study says People who cuss a lot, uh, you know, are extremely intelligent and have a high IQ, whatever the study may have mm-hmm. been, are very intelligent people and are very productive or, you know, whatever, whatever it was. Yeah. And then another one that said, well, you know, uh, cussing just shows unintelligence, you know, kind of thing. And, and so you see the both and it's like, you know, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think you also generally know. You know, not not for us to get on like a huge, you know, topic about cussing, but like the difference between somebody who cusses but is generally an intelligent person and somebody who cusses is just not a yeah. very intelligent it's, person. It's just, right? That's so, one of their five vocabulary words. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So 
Yeah, no, it's uh, it's something I see, especially with say Gary Vee, and for instance, for for example, it's he has a company. He had and he doesn't act that way all the time too. And some of it is is part of his branding of himself. That that is what has gotten him where he is. Not that he said, I'm going to cuss, this is going to get me followers or this is going to make me, but this is just who he's comfortable with being. And that's, and it, it's just how his mind flows. And I mean, he has a lot going on in his mind. So it's, it's, it shows intelligence as well. Well, between his energy, you know, I think it's just kind of like you get the energy of who he is, but you know, it's the, the, everything else you get out of it, if that's, excuse me, something that bothers you, but it's like, but what kind of, you know, are you being inspired? He inspired me so much when I was out of work earlier this year. Uh, you know, I was sleeping on a friend's couch and I didn't have a job. And this was before I started like my side business as well. And, I, you know, I was, I was kind of in a rut and, um, I started watching him and it was so infectious yeah. and same, I love what he was it was, it, you know, and, and it's funny because you work in radio and it's like, who's the most famous and coolest person you've met? And like the days where you're like, oh, I want to meet Lady Gaga. And now I'm like, you know who I want to meet? I want to meet Gary friggin' V. I want to meet Simon Sinek. I want to meet these people who are so influential uh, um, for me now. And I love their energy. And I wouldn't even know, I wouldn't even know what to ask. I would, I would want to be like, Hey, can we sit down for an hour? And you know, that's not possible. Cause the guy's kind of, no, he's not going to get an hour. Right he's lucky to get 15 minutes. If that, if, right. if right. that was somebody, do you have a, a goal Brody? What, what is something that, you know, an art overarching um, mission that you're on or a goal that you have? I, I got about five minutes left. Um, yeah. I only have two uh, questions for you. I think uh, um, a goal is just, you know, I want to continue to work with people and make an impact with, with what I enjoy doing, because when you love what you do, you know, you're going to do your best work and it's not even, you know, you don't even feel like you're working and, and you're making an impact. You're leaving a mark, um, in the universe, you know, you're contributing and that's what I enjoy doing. You know, I think for so many years, I was kind of very selfish. I'm like, oh, I love what I do and working in radio and blah, 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 blah. But now I love helping people and with the skill set that I've developed, you know, and, and really leaving a mark. And, but at the same time, you know, growing as an individual and, and figuring out, well, I professionally have a lot of things figured out personally, you know, my therapist tells me you still have some growth to do <laughs> and, you know, and there's a reason that you are where you are personally. And so, you know, just to continue growing and making an impact and helping people. Brody, maybe you can think of this two ways. One for the listeners of what they're going through, but have, and you mentioned a therapist, you mentioned sleeping on your friend's couch and being in a funk. I was in a funk the last couple of weeks and, and, and things seemed really tough losing my mom, my mother, my grandmother-in-law, my sister-in-law. I lost my job and then got it back somehow. Oh. And there's people like this. So have you faced some adversity in your life that you either look to, to motivate you, or it's, it's maybe it's hindering you, but it's something that you're bringing with you in your drive and your work. Yes. I, you know, you know, I, I thought a lot about why I have kind of gotten caught up in some of the poor relationships. Not that I've had a string of poor relationships, like maybe, you know, the one or two relationships that were really unhealthy and why I stayed in it so long. And, you know, you, you know, you're, if you're going to some form of therapy, it's, it forces you to be more conscious of the decisions you make and, and why you make the decisions you make. And, you know, when I grew up, I said earlier that, you know, I, I was a happy kid at home, but, you know, I was bullied. Um, and uh, to be honest with you, I don't know why. I had a conversation with my sister recently where she was like, well, maybe it's just that you showed some kind of weakness. And, you know, you know, kids are, you know, kids are kids. Uh, they're cruel sometimes. And, and I think, you know, when you try to think back to like how you grew up and how that impacted you as an adult. And, and I think about that. So like when I was growing up, I had a lot of that. And I think my outlet was 
doing the filmmaking and, and, you know, doing what I enjoy doing at home. Mm. Um, and then going to school and putting up with that kind of crap. And, you know, now as an adult, maybe that's why I am the way as an adult and why I'm so outspoken and honest because I, you know, wasn't that kid. You know, Do you have some like, advice for people who might be in the same sort of situation in terms of motivating them, encouraging them in their work to kind of keep going? Well, you know, f- for me, it would be never stop learning. You know, there's always something to learn. But also, it's if you're enjoying what you're doing, that says a lot. And, uh, you know, your support system is super important. You know, the people who know you best know you inside and out. And, you know, they should be your cheerleaders effortlessly. You know, the the people who are closest to you should, you know, I mean, it it doesn't make an effort to, to want to root on, you know, you know, family or friends, right. And say, no, you know what you're doing. You're good at this or, you know, and, and meet people, network, talk to people, talk to people in what you want to do. And people say you're the sum of like the clo- the five people in your life, you know, which, you know, I think that is pers- personally and professionally, you are the sum of the closest people to you. So if you want to do something as, as a career or a job, network with those kind of people and pick their brain and, mm-hmm. or, you know, see if you can learn from somebody or, you know, ask somebody if they want to mentor you, maybe somebody you look up to, but, um, I think as long as you're enjoying what you're doing and, you know, looking at something as, as money not being like the prime motivator, um, you know, I think if you're giving true value in whatever it is you want to do, the money will come. I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in that. So, um, speaking of money, Brody, how can people reach you? Brodyradio.com. Uh, is the website and I'm on multiple, multiple social media channels. They're all the same at Brody radio, B R O D Y radio. Brody Smith. I have one final question for you. Why do you work? That's the hardest question. And yet it should be the easiest. Uh, Well, to create value to give value, to make an impact is really why I want to work. And I do what I enjoy doing because it doesn't feel like work. You know, I, I really feel for people who go to a job and they're like, this sucks. And I would love to find out what their story is. And do you have something you enjoy doing? Why didn't you pursue that? Because if, if, and, and everything to some degree eventually feels like a job, there's always a time, even if you enjoy doing what you're doing, there's going to be days where you feel like it's a job. But if you do what you love and you provide value through whatever your skill set is, what you're good at, then, you know, and you're not chasing the money, then, and you're truly providing value, I think you'll get value back, you know, and even exchange, hopefully. And if it's not even, then, you know, try aligning yourself with places where you know you're making an impact, you're bringing value, and that they value you because you know your own value, your true value. So, you know, try to align yourself where you're going to get that kind of exchange. But, you know, I just love being a part of a bigger kind of cause and making an impact and, and, and adding value. Brody Smith, it, I, I, believe, I believe you're true to that with teamwork, adding value with integrity, multimedia producer and host Brody Smith. Thank you for your time. And I appreciate the work that you do. Thank you, Brian.